Hi, Geraldine. I'm going to quickly test my audio if that's working. We are here. Oh, now I can't. Oh, you're on mute, David. Hi, Geraldine. Hello, Perf. It's always nice, isn't it, when you can hear the other people <laughs> on the nice. call? Yes. <laughs> yeah, how are you? I'm a bit Friday afternoon ish, I'll be honest. Right. Well, that's going to be Friday evening in India. It's absolutely. Hi, How are you guys doing? Very well, thank you. <laughs> Not as good as you with the with the northern lights in the background. Very good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'd keep it a little more interesting today. Absolutely. Yeah. So, how many people are we expecting? Um, I'm not sure. I'd, I'll check. I'll, I'm going to open the YouTube studio and then take a look at that once we start. It's, it's a bit funny, David, this, because um, you, you, whilst we're running this through Zoom, actually delegates watch it through YouTube. So you won't see um, that you're really popular, unfortunately, with the participants on this screen. You have to go across to YouTube. But uh, I got caught out with it the last time because um, YouTube runs about three seconds later. So if you did have YouTube open, you'd end up getting feedback. So I had to zip yeah. across and turn that off. So uh, right. yeah, just a bit of extra excitement on a Friday afternoon. So I think I just won't go there then. Yeah. <laughs> hi, Morali. Hi, hi Morali. Hi, hi. Good, good evening. Good afternoon to all of you there. And to you. Sorry, I got a bit late and I just reached home and I had to freshen up and <laughs> log in. No problem.
Have you um, been able to make us presenters, Gracious? Yes, so I think I'm going to, you are going to be starting in any case, right? I'll be assisting David with his slides. And I have his. Murli, you, will you be having some slides to share as well? Yeah, yeah I have. I'm just going to make all of you co-hosts right now. So that, that's not an issue. Gracious, would you um, would you like us to send you any questions that you could ask us? Well, sure, yeah. in, and then if you don't get any, um, mm -hmm. you would have ours where you could oh, yeah, yeah. pretend. I mean, I have I have a few myself. So <laughs> <laughs> well, feel free to share good, those in advance, to, Gracious, as well. Doubts, yeah. just, it's a good chance to just clear all your doubts that you have. <laughs> There are quite a few. The, Go ahead. Yeah, you could see the look of fear on our faces <laughs> the last time. <laughs> we were thinking, oh my goodness, please don't let it be from me. So, <laughs> what are you saying? You did a fantastic job. Oh, uh, it, it was a great team effort. David has a lot of, to live up to. So, I'm mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if my screen just goes blank at uh, four o'clock, you'll know why. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you pretend, if you can just pretend, you can just freeze yourself, and then we yes. all panic at that point. So, <laughs> I'm gonna drop a message on our WhatsApp group right about now. Maybe we can start in like two minutes. Yeah. This yeah, time, this good. time, Geraldine's going first. So. I, I got big... the I got the lucky slot, I think here. So. Yeah, it's going to be quite late by the time we finish, isn't it? And mm -hmm. four thirty yeah. is what eight is nine o'clock in the evening. Right. Yeah. For us, it's going to be quite late in the night. But it's, I mean, it's great because we know what people do is just they save all the links and then they watch it later. Watch it again, yeah. Yeah, and there's hardly any content um, in, in the way that we have structured it and the way uh, it being a six-part series with a continuous conversation. There's hardly any content like that on the internet, actually. So it's great for most people. Should I share my screen now? Would that be yeah. all right? You can try it out. 
Great. Is that okay? okay. So, uh, Gracious, you're going to do a, a, a little introduction? Yes. Lovely. Um, David, what we did last time is when we weren't talking, the rest of us turned our um, uh, mics oh. off and the picture off as well. So yeah. entirely up to you if you wanted to look <laughs> as if really studious and interested. But if you want to do something else for the half hour while the rest of us are talking, feel free. So, No, I can't think of anything I'd, I'd rather do than, than listen to you, obviously, <laughs> and watch. <laughs> but I'd, no, I'd, I wouldn't want to distract the audience by, by having my video on, so I'll, I'll, I will turn. You know off. what? The speakers sure, have the right. liberty to like ask each other questions as well. I think we should oh, have that. that, that would, that, that's a step too far. We're, we're too <laughs> kind to do that to each other. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, unless we can think of some nice soft questions. Some soft questions, right? Yeah. That's a good uh, way. Um, <clears throat> sort of um, how many years experience of FIDIC have you got Geraldine you know, like <laughs> yeah. or, although um, is that a nice one because it might show my age and the the, the, the filtering that seems to be working quite well at <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you've got the perfect balance of um, youth and experience that you yeah. can uh, <laughs> get across uh, yeah, maybe qu quite a bit but not too much <laughs> choose my words carefully so <clears throat> All right, I suppose we could start 6.31 here. So good evening from India to uh, all those joining us today um, to the SCL India virtual roadshow on FIDIC contracts being organized in collaboration with Driver Tread, Heating Chambers and uh, Kethan and Company. <clears throat> I'm particularly glad actually about today because we're halfway through the series now. Uh, this is this was conceptualized to be a six-part series uh, of on FIDIC contracts, uh, having a session every month so that we can sort of take in the content, try to digest it, and sort of move further and have it in a long stretch of like six months. And so far, we've been able to cover the FIDIC suite of contracts. We've been able to cover a topic on the practical administration of FIDIC contracts where we dive deep on program timelines, variations and valuations. And so now we are in session three, where we will sort of narrow down a few more practical considerations in, uh, in the FIDIC contracts. And these are going to be things like, how um, does the payment regime exactly work? Right? Along with certain ancillaries concerning the payment regime. Um, and we'll also see contractors obligation concerning design. Um, and I'm particularly interested to sort of understand, you know, design vis-a-vis -vis employees requirements, because that's one issue that really pops up all the time concerning FIDIC contracts. And then of course, we'll lastly end it with termination from both the contractor and the employer's perspective. The, and the, the way David puts it, the when, the how, and what, right? Um, and as, as always, we have a stellar panel. And uh, in, this, in this panel, I think David's the only variable here. The rest of us are constants from session two. So let me start by introducing David. Um, so the last time I met David was in Delhi, and uh, I think uh, David particularly enjoyed the spicy Indian food because that really kept him awake all night. <laughs> but it, it, it's lovely having you. I'm uh, having you here, David. Um, David's a King's Council. Uh, he's a member of Keating Chambers, London, and uh, the way I, I've described him before is that he's pretty much been in everything that is high profile. Um, starting with the Shard, the Wembley, the Olympic, and the Burj Khalifa. These are some of the, those illustrations of uh, David's career and the kind of work he does. Um, so thanks again, David, for joining us today. And we will be looking forward to hearing you. It's a pleasure. I'm delighted to be here. Right. Um, joining us again is Dr. Jagannathan Murali. He's currently a faculty member at the LMT Institute Project Management. 
Now, he's one of those rare mixes uh, who's been in the field as well as someone now who is in his academic career. Um, and at the LNT Institute, he, uh, he's someone who is now training um, the new generation of project managers. And I'm sure we'll be, uh, we'll be very enlightened to hear his views on, on the contract, uh, contractor's obligations concerning design. So Murali, thanks so much for joining. Thank you, thank you so much, Richard. We we'll look forward to hearing from you as well. Next, Geraldine Fleming. Um, she's the operations director at Driver Tread. And she has a remarkable feat of, you know, having worked in the construction industry, and we were just talking about it, as she's been in the construction industry for more than 25 years now, and with the last 20 years uh, or so in dispute resolution particularly. Now, she holds, uh, she's a QS and holds a law degree, you know, making her double-edged, if I may put it that way. Uh, and she's exceptionally skillful, perhaps given her qualifications in claim negotiations and I was reading your profile and I, I wouldn't want to be on the opposite side uh, facing uh, uh, Geraldine ever. Um, but perhaps it may be an opportunity as well, who knows. Um, so Geraldine, thanks a lot for joining us and for sharing your valuable time and you know, preparing the presentation. So for all the viewers, I just want to let you know that what the format is going to be. We'll start with uh, the first speaker who's going to be Geraldine, who will speak for 30 minutes on the payment regime. And then we'll move to Murali, who'll speak for 30 minutes on the design obligations. We'll take a small break. And after that, we'll return um, to hear David on the issue of termination. And in the meanwhile, while you're hearing this, I would encourage all of you to actually look at the chat box. There's a, there's a chat box. You can just go ahead and drop in your questions or your comments or any of the remarks that you might have. Um, and we'll be sure to sort of respond to that either on the chat box or I'll take a few questions from there and we'll end it with a small open forum session for the all, for all the three speakers. Um, I suppose with that, we can start with um, Geraldine on the payment regime. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Gracious. And I'm uh, also delighted to be here on this esteemed panel for this afternoon session. Um, hopefully everyone can see my slides. Um, in relation to what we're talking about, Gracious obviously has already said, we're looking at payment design and termination. And this first half hour is looking at the payments side. Um, I have put a couple of notes in, in relation to the work um, that I do with the company I work for, which is Driver Tret, which is part of the Driver Group. And you can see there that I've specifically highlighted that we pride ourselves in advising clients, contractors, subcontractors on dispute avoidance. And that certainly is the purpose of the sessions that we're involved in with the SCL India. Established in 1978, we are stock exchange listed, as well as having a network of offices around the world. Now, I have to say, I do like to give people further reading to do um, after any webinars or seminars that I give. Um, and so can I highly recommend our Digest magazine, which is available on the uh, internet website. It's available through our marketing department, or you can actually do the QR code. Um, I'd specifically highlight an article that one of my colleagues has written on AI and the use of chat, uh, CPG, uh, very well worthwhile having a look at. But on with the show for today. So as Grace has already mentioned, the first part is looking at payments. So we're going to look at the payment regime, lump sum prices, what should be in an interim payment, looking briefly at advanced payment, what happens if the contractor is paid late and then finishing off with a little bit on retention. So the payment regime. It all starts off with clause 14.3. Um, 14.3 starts by saying the contractor shall submit a statement in six copies to the engineer after the end of each month. If I just stop there for a couple of minutes, it talks about submitting a statement. And of course, a key issue here is how should you submit that statement? Can you send it by email? If you're going to send it by email, what address are you going to use? Or should it be issued by hard copy? What we must remember here, of course, that 
FIDIC 1999 was issued when effectively an awful lot of people didn't even have email addresses. So clause 1.3 in the contract actually doesn't refer to the use of emails. And so I would thoroughly advise everybody if you're going to use a FIDIC 99 contract, that you specifically address how the parties are going to communicate with each other. And also for the purposes of payment, how the contractor is going to send its application or its statement across to the engineer. That method of service is very important. You can see it talks about six copies. Again, you can see it's before email. Um, I would envisage that, of course, that refers to a situation where everything was done by paper and a number of parts of organisations needed their own individual copy. So, again, that would be something that I would advise you to change as well. So, is it going to be email to which address and is it just one copy that's going to be sent? It talks about the statement being submitted after the end of each month. Of course, again, I wouldn't want a contractor allowing that to drift too much. The first of the month is the date I would advise that that statement is issued. It talks about the statement being in a form approved by the engineer. Now, again, a very good idea is as part of your contract negotiations in the pre-contract situation that you actually agree the format that's going to be used and you include that template format in the contract to avoid any issues as to whether the engineer is happy with it or any approval type processes. The clause continues saying that the contractor's statement must show in detail the amounts to which the contractor considers himself to be entitled, together with supporting documentation. And again, I've highlighted that phrase, supporting documentation. The clause does end here by saying that it must include the report on progress, but do think about what else you should also be including. Potentially a copy of the programme, potentially marked up drawings, and also photographs. I think the more evidence that the contractor puts with its statement, then the more likely it is to have certified and paid the amount that it actually asks for in that statement. The clause continues and sets out a list of items that are to be included in that statement. And I've reproduced that on the slide in front of you. I'm going to paraphrase uh, some of these items. So the statement shall include the following items expressed in the appropriate currency and it's got to be in the sequence listed. So I would definitely recommend that the statement uses A, B, C, D, E, as you can see down the left hand side of the screen. Item A talks about the estimated contract value of the works executed and the contractor's document produced to the end of the month, including variations. So again, if I was on the contractor's side, I would definitely want that to be broken down to make the engineer's job as easy as possible. If you imagine as the contractor, the engineer is going to sit there effectively with a red pen and tick or cross the items that have been applied for. Item B uh, talks about two potential options. Firstly, whether there have been any changes in legislation that can be applied for. Uh, of course, we're all very familiar with rules and regulations in relation to COVID, changing legislation over the past few years. And also there's an option to have uh, an allowance for changes in cost. And of course, that's referring to inflation. That's covered at item B. Retention is covered at item C. We're going to have a separate couple of slides on that later on. Item D also needs particular attention in relation to advance payment. Now, we will look at the slides with regard to the rules and regulations on advance payment in a couple of minutes. The key thing for me here in relation to the 
monthly statements or the interim applications is that you have made sure you've agreed how the advance payment will be dealt with through the monthly applications as the job proceeds. The contractor does not want the advance payment deducted on the first statement after they've started work on site, but equally the clients and engineer probably don't want the advance payment only taken account of right at the end of the project. So that's something that needs to be agreed. Item E covers plant and materials in accordance with subclause 415. F, any other additions or deductions which may have become due, including those under clause 20, which of course is the claims clause, which will be the subject of a later seminar um, given by SCL India. In terms of deductions on this, of course, the main item that comes to mind would be liquidated damages. Finally, item G is the deduction of amounts certified in previous payment certificates. So the contractor has quite a bit of work to do here, thinking about the method of service, who the statement is going to go to, where the copies need to go elsewhere, and making sure that their monthly statement follows exactly the order and the list in this particular clause. Remember, advance payments in particular. If I go back to item A, it talks about the estimated contract value of the works estimated. Now, a common problem, not just in relation to FIDIC, but most construction contracts, is where the contractor has included lump sums within its original contract price. That is dealt with under FIDIC, under Clause 141B. And the clause says that the contractor shall submit to the engineer within 28 days after the commencement date a proposed breakdown of each lump sum price in the schedules. Now, again, I think there's an easy way through this. I think as part of the contract negotiations before the contract is signed, I think the party should work towards having that breakdown provided and agreed. And again, a small amendment to the clause that says the breakdown is as contained in appendix, whatever, appendix C to the contract. Importantly, the last part of this particular clause says the engineer may take account of the breakdown when preparing the payment certificates, but shall not be bound by it. Again, if you have pre-agreed the breakdown, my advice would be that you do again want to amend that clause. Jumping across to clause 14.6. First point to make about clause 14.6 is that there is no obligation on the engineer or the employer to certify or pay until the performance security is received. So again, this must be an item that's very high up on the contractor's list. If there is going to be a performance security or a bond, that must be put in place at the earliest possible opportunity. 14.6 continues by dealing with the engineer's responsibilities. And I will say that I think that FIDIC is being far too generous to engineers here. Because from the date when the contractor issues their monthly statement, the engineer has 28 days to issue an interim payment certificate. I think that's far too long. I would definitely recommend from actually all parties' perspectives, that that period is narrowed. For a contractor not to know how much they're going to be paid for a period of 28 days, that seems unnecessarily long. Interestingly, um, in the UK, we've had legislation that's amended that period to five days. So again, somewhere between zero and 28 days should be something that the parties actually address again as part of the tender negotiations that take place. The other part I'll point out about this middle paragraph is that the engineer has a duty to fairly 
determine the amount of the interim payment certificate. And I will again highlight that word fairly determine. They've got to decide the correct amount that needs to be paid. Final paragraph on this slide emphasizes that the engineer in a payment certificate can correct amounts made in previous payment certificates. So for me, I would like to emphasize on that particular clause that effectively these interim certificates are exactly that. They are interim and can be revisited. The clause ends by saying a payment certificate shall not be deemed to indicate the engineer's acceptance, approval, consent or satisfaction. Effectively, it is a payment on account. So we've we've had two exchanges so far. The contractor has issued its monthly statement and the engineer has responded within this rather long 28 day period. Of course, there's still no money in the contractor's bank yet. And that's where clause 14.7 comes in. 14.7 splits payment up into three sections. Clause 14.7a confirms when the advanced payment is made. So it's within 42 days after the letter of acceptance or 21 days after receiving the performance security, whichever is the later. Now, again, I think these periods are too long, but the contractor must not delay on making sure that they have complied with the requirements of this clause, because otherwise, of course, they're at more risk the longer that they are without receipt of payment of that advanced amount of money. Item B deals with the normal situation. The vast majority of payments will be the interim payments that are made. Again, I have another criticism on this particular clause because it says that item B, that the employer shall pay to the contractor the amount certified in each payment certificate within 56 days after the engineer receives that statement and supporting documents. 56 days, far too long again from my perspective. Effectively, if we're thinking about a contractor putting in an application for payment, let's say on the 1st of April, the contractor isn't going to know what they're going to get paid until the 29th of April and has to wait till the 27th of May before they actually receive the money in their account. So that again needs addressing. 14.7c finally deals with the final payment certificate. Again, the period is 56 days. Finally, it talks about payments being made into the bank account, nominated by the contractor. Think about including the bank account details as part of the monthly statement. So there is no possibility for the client saying, well, I haven't got your bank details in order to make that payment. And um, if you do have your own copy of FIDIC, you will see early on in the printed version that they have very helpfully done a chart. The top half of the chart is the interim payment regime and the bottom part of the chart is the final payment regime. And you can see for that final payment, whilst the 56 days remains the same, actually it's a much longer period overall. And again, I'll repeat my advice is definitely think about if you're the contractor, reducing those periods. Otherwise effectively as the contractor, you will be the organization that's funding the project. What happens then if the contractor is paid late? Well, FIDIC luckily enough does address this particular issue at clause 14.8. It says, if the contractor does not receive payment in accordance with subclause 14.7, the contractor shall be entitled to receive 
financing charges compounded monthly on the amount unpaid during the period of delay. Now, I don't know about everybody else who's listening in to this particular seminar. I know my credit card does not compound monthly. It unfortunately compounds daily. And I would guess that a contractor's bank also compounds daily as well. So again, this is another criticism that I do have of FIDIC in relation to the compounding of these finance charges. You could either look at changing monthly to daily, or another way of looking at this is actually to look at the percentage that can be claimed. Now, the percentage is addressed in the second paragraph. Unless otherwise stated in the particular conditions, these financing charges shall be calculated at the annual rate of three percentage points above the discount rate of the central bank in the country of the currency of payment and shall be paid in such currency. So the default percentage is 3% above the local bank rate. But of course, you could put a higher percentage in the particular conditions. If I was working for the contractor, I'd want a percentage in there that was high enough to discourage late payment. The final thing I would say in relation to this particular slide is in my experience, annoyingly, it is actually rare that this clause is invoked by the contractor. And I think that contractors, particularly with interest rates going up in many parts of the world, that this is something that needs to be looked at and addressed going forward. The final main part of this um, session on payments is looking at retention. Now, bear in mind, I've already said and criticised the lengthy certification and payment periods in the contract. But you need to also add in that the employer has the right to hold money back through the retention clauses. Now, this is dealt with in 14.9 in the contract. In the appendix, particular conditions, it talks about the percentage of retention and also a limit on the retention monies. The typical retention percentage that we would see would be around the three to five percent but actually, I have seen percentages as high as 10 or even 15 percent. So that's something that needs to be looked at and considered by all parties involved. We then look at when the monies are actually paid back. When does the contractor receive the re released retention monies? If the taking over certificate for the whole works is issued, then half is released. If the taking over certificate for part of the works is issued, then 40% of the retention is released. The balance of retention is then issued after the latest of the defects notification periods. So again, you need to check your contracts to see what the defects notification period is. Is it six months, 12 months or 24 months? Because that's how long that balance of monies will actually be held for. So a very, um, very brief summary then in relation to what we've been through. We talked about the contract price has got to be uh, agreed and determined. The contractor has got to submit the breakdown of the lump sums. We talked about the performance guarantee as well. That is a precursor to payment and a precursor to advance payment. I certainly was critical of the fact that the contract talks about submitting six copies and that it doesn't address emails, but of course, that's because it's dated 1999. That also needs to be considered by the parties. So you have a clear contractual method for actually submitting the particular statements and the name of the party that they're going to be sent to as well. 
The engineer's duty, of course, is to issue the payment certificate and their determination has to be fairly determined. Going back to the contractor, the contractor can help the engineer reach the right figure by providing not just the Excel spreadsheet, the monthly statements, programs, etc. Payment then is to be made within 56 days of the statement. Again, I criticise that. That's a little bit too long. Do watch out for the financing charges and do also watch out for the retention release as well. Just about within time, Gracious appeared exactly at the right time to remind me that I only have till um, half past the hour to um, to complete. Otherwise, I'm eating into Morali's presentation. Uh, you, were, you were exactly on time. And uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. I have like three questions for you, but I'm going to put that while we are doing our open forum. Um, so we're now going to slide into uh, design. And uh, Dr. Murali is going to take that session for us. Um, the stage is yours, Murali. Yeah, thanks. Let me just share the screen. Uh, is my uh, screen visible? Yes, it is. Right. So thank you, Geraldine, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, let me uh, continue from uh, 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 from the design part of uh, FIDIC contract document. That's what I'm going to talk in the next 30 minutes. So uh, we have seen this coverage. So let me straight away get into the uh, discussion. Now, the moment I say design, uh, so the design or the design obligations, the first thing that comes into our mind, at least uh, in projects where contractor, uh, the design obligation is that of the contractor, like in silver and yellow books, is that there would be a lot of submissions. There will be a lot of documentation work which had that which which needs uh, sometimes an approval from the employer or sometimes that's just submitted for information or for review now in fidic contracts any contractor submission comes under the heading of contractors documents and if it is a silver book or yellow book these documents should be fit for purpose now what do you mean by fit for purpose and fit for the purpose of what so every contract is executed by an employer for an overall intended purpose. And this is the purpose which FIDIC refers to as fit for this fit for the purpose. And this purpose is typically defined under employer's requirement. Now, why this fit for purpose term is something that is very important is that in one particular uh, judgment of Madras High Court, the court has defined what is the meaning of fit for purpose. And it says, it if it remained a turnkey project, the additional work claims would in principle be unsustainable unless it can be demonstrated that these claims arise out of work that is clearly outside the scope of the turnkey project. So in case of turnkey projects and in case of yellow book kind of projects where it is fit for purpose, whatever that is not uh, probably defined by the employer, but it is required for the overall completion of the work and to meet the intended purpose that comes under the scope of, under the, scope of the contractor. And this is the point where, at least in my experience, there have been a couple of projects where uh, we didn't expect a particular scope of work to be under us. That's mainly because uh, we, we could not gauge the requirements under this fit for purpose clause. Now, as I told earlier, fit for purpose or the intended purpose is defined under employee's requirement in silver and yellow books. I'll come to the red book uh, slightly later, but under silver and yellow book, it comes under employee's requirement. And this employee's requirement typically covers some of the uh, important provisions like tests on completion and tests after completion. Sometimes this becomes very critical. Health, safety and environment requirements, quality spares. And you have a list of items. I've just given you an illustrative list of items, but there are a number of items that can get into employee's requirement. Now, again, employee's requirement is a very important document uh, because that comes as one of the key document under the uh, order of precedence. So I'll come to that later. Now, when a document is submitted, the next question would be, uh, does it require a review or an approval? Now, if a document is submitted only for a review, uh, then it, there is a time that is available for the employer uh, to employer or the engineer according to the contract that we're talking about uh, to review this uh, content and get back. And what happens if they don't come back? We'll see to that. 
and if it is an approval there is a need for the contractor to get an approval before they proceed further now whether a document requires a review or an approval depends again upon the employer's requirement and this should specify this requirement so wherever applicable uh, review period typically does not exceed 21 days and uh, this 21 days starts from a notice under section 5.2 and uh, whenever a contractor submits a contractor's document it accompanies this notice under 5.2 which indicates that uh, indicates the readiness and the contract compliance for whatever documents that is being submitted or the extent of non compliance uh, now there's one place fedix says that these are the documents that should be ready for use and uh, when it says ready for use it doesn't mean that it has to be ready for the use at the site but it can also be a document that is ready for use for subsequent documentation so that needs to be taken into consideration uh in case of uh, silver and yellow book contractor is responsible for the adequacy stability and safety of the works because of course the design is under the obligation of the contractor so contractor is responsible for that now here comes the question very critical question what if there was an error in employer's requirement because that would had that would have repercussions on what the contractor would be submitting now contractor's error is separately dealt under 5.8 but let's look at what happens if there is an employer's error in employer's requirement and are there any exceptions for the contractor's responsibility for accuracy adequacy if there is an employer's requirement now let's look at it uh, in yellow book and silver book this is typically dealt under section 5.1 in case of yellow book wherein uh, they have very nicely given the procedure to deal uh, under uh, deal with circumstances uh, wherein there is an error uh, there is an error in employer's requirement now let's take the date of the commencement and uh, after the date of commencement it is important for a contractor to scrutinize employer's requirement and items of reference and this includes design criteria and also calculations now in the case of any error fault or defect now from the commencement you start scrutinizing the employer's requirements and in the event the contractor finds any error fault or defect the contractor is supposed to send a notice under section 5.1 of yellow book now this notice is also having a time bar period you cannot send this notice whenever you want but this has to be sent within a period as per the appendix to tender that's mentioned in the appendix to tender so it's important that you keep a note of this requirement because i tell you sometimes there might be a confusion between the period mentioned in the appendix to tender and the and the provision under section 20.1 i'll come to that in a short while now once this notice is submitted within the time bar period as required under section 5.1 and the appendix to tender this can be this may be treated as a variation depending upon what is the impact that it is going to have on the cost and time of the project however fedic yellow book also is very careful and it says that subject to the extent to which it was discoverable taking the, taking into account the practicality scenario in tender while inspecting the site and employees requirements this is very important because uh typically when the contractor is um, inspecting the site it is expected that um, a prudent contractor inspects what all that is available for the contractor and makes an intelligent uh, calculation of what might get into set of some of their assumptions while bidding for the project now sometimes it so happens that there can be certain restrictions for the contractors to um, what to say uh, during the, the 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 site inspection in the tender stage Uh, so i remember a project where uh, we had certain restrictions because we were working on a uh, on a project that was supposed to be a brownfield project where there was supposed to be an expansion of an existing facility so when we visited the project for inspecting the site there were a number of restrictions that were imposed on us uh, with respect to what can be inspected and what cannot be inspected and areas where we could not inspect uh, we made a elaborate record of that and this was discussed in the pre bid meeting and we brought to the notice of the employer that these are the areas where uh, we could not really inspect the site and in yet another instance i remember this uh, very um, nice court case uh, between power grid corporation and siemens india limited uh, wherein the employer power grid uh, changed the location of the site and was and very little time was available for the contractor to scrutinize the site or to contractor to uh, what to say uh to 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 inspect the site and this was not practically possible it was not practically possible for anybody to inspect this in, within this short time and when this was also recorded and later there were some issues because of the um 
what to say the the the, the lapses or, or or the shortcomings in the um, inspection and and the contractor could effectively deal with it because uh, they could prove that they they were not the, given the time the error or whatever the difference was not discoverable uh, during this prepaid inspection so this is very important here uh, that is the employer evaluates the extent to which uh, the the particular error or a defect or a fault is discoverable was discoverable for a prudent contractor and uh, the cost and the time entitlements are linked to 1.7 and 4.7 um, so again 1.7 and 4.7 uh, is subject to provisions of clause 20.1 uh, 1.9 basically deals with uh, uh, the errors in employer requirements and 4.7 basically deals with setting out. Now, as I told you that 1.9 and 4.7 are linked to section 20.1. Now, according to section 20.1, uh, it is important that you submit a notice within 28 days from the day on which you came to know or you are supposed to know that particular, uh, the, the trigger for that particular event. And let's consider a scenario where the time that is mentioned in appendix to tender within which you could send a section uh, notice under section 5.1 regarding an error fault or defect is around 14 days which is less than 28 days and suppose you don't meet that requirement a question might come whether i'm still entitled for a claim under 20.1 because 20.1 gives me 28 days as the notice period now if you look at this 20.1 very carefully at the last paragraph of 20.1 there is there is a there is a paragraph that states that the requirements under 20.1 is in addition to any other requirements under the clause under which a particular claim is being lodged. So if section 5.1 calls for a stringent time bar, it is always better for the contractor to adhere to the stringent time bar. That is, if it is less than 28, adhere to that rather than blindly depending on the provisions under section 20.1. And I have practically experienced this because in a particular project, there was an error or, or what I say, there was a there was a requirement that was given by an employer as per the employer's requirement, according to which the heading was something was X and the content was referring to some other requirement Y. And uh, and under that circumstance, we, we could have actually brought this notice to the employer much earlier, but we did not do it. And we missed out the time under Section 5.1 and we could not do anything later. So these are certain issues that are important that you need to keep in mind when you want to point out the error fault or defect in uh, employer's requirement. In case of silver book, it's it's very simple. It's a statement. You can see there are kind of a disclaimer that says employer is not responsible for error and shall not relieve the contractor from the responsibility of for design and execution of the work. So this is very important because this is the nature of silver book. And there is no provision similar to 1.9 and 4.7 of yellow in silver book. Now, sometimes you might think that this is very unfair, but in my opinion, it is not unfair because Silver book is meant for such projects where there, it is not expected to have a number of uncertainties. It is silver book is re recommended for projects where there are not much of underground related works. But in spite of that, if the employer chooses silver book for a project where a lot of uncertainties can be expected, definitely this particular clause will be a problem for the contractor. So it is important to make sure that the employer maps the uh, the, the, the purpose of the book with the risks in the project. And that's very important. Uh, and also in a silver book, uh, in, in, in silver book, the contractor is expected to be very technically strong. So therefore the employer's errors or faults, if any, it is, it is deemed that the contractor is capable enough to find that out and rectify that whenever they find it out without having to pass on the risk to the employer. And silver, silver book is also used in projects where the employee's requirement of involvement is very minimum. So taking into account all these requirements, I do believe that this is a fair clause, especially in a silver book, provided silver book is recommended for a project that fits the silver book's requirement. That's important. And that's where many clients, uh, uh, the employers, at least in India, do a mistake of prescribing silver book in a project that's not suited for a silver book. And there's the whole lot of litigation that follows. Now, uh, coming back to the uh, contractor's design obligation in silver and yellow book, and it's important to note here that an employer's consent for designers is required in case of yellow book, uh, wherein the uh, there is also a requirement for the employer to ensure that 
uh, employer also wants the contractor to ensure that the designer has a language fluency, especially in, in projects where you have a lot of international involvement. And uh, it is expected that the designer will be available to discuss the design issue with the engineer. So the, all these are specifically mentioned in employer um, under employer's consent for designers in yellow book. But in silver book, not such require no such requirement. Again, this is in accordance with the rationale of the silver book, where employer need not involve as much as an employer would involve in a yellow book. So basically, in a silver book, there is a lot of thrust on employer employers. Sorry, a lot of thrust on contractors' competency and the capability, and therefore employer minimizes the involvement with the contractors' works. And that's why you could have seen that you would have seen that in in a silver book we don't have that engineer concept, but in yellow book we have an exclusive engineer for monitoring the uh, work that is done by the contractor. Now, uh, in case of, uh, I'm coming to this most important point of the priority of documents. Now, in um, PIDIC yellow book, there's something called a contractor's proposal and there's something called employer's requirement. Now, if there's an ambiguity between the contractor's proposal and employer's requirement, then the clause 1.5, there is a priority of documents or the order of priority or order of precedence will be applicable. Now, what could be this kind of an ambiguity? Now, in a tender stage, employer comes up with their requirements and that's available in the tender document. Now, a contractor prepares an elaborate proposal as a part of the tender submission, as a part of their offer submission. Now, in the content of the contractor's proposal, if there is something that is ambiguous to the employer's requirement, uh, say, for example, employer's requirement, there's an employer's requirement of a particular HSC, particular health, safety and environment requirement. And they are specific on certain aspects. And if the contractor's proposal is ambiguous to, uh, or, or different from such requirement, even though the employer may not highlight the differences in the contractor's proposal from that of employer's requirement in the tender stage, even though that is there, even though the ambiguity continues in the execution stage, the, according to the priority of documents, employer requirements has a higher precedence when compared to the contractor's proposal. This is where the contractors need to be very, very careful when they're submitting their offer because they might think that they have submitted their offer. It can be a part of the contract very well, but in the event of an ambiguity, contractor's proposal takes the last priority. So therefore, it again reinforces the importance or the supremacy of employer's requirements in these kind of contracts. And in the event the contract contractor wants their proposal to be taken very seriously, it is important that the contractor insists on modifying the employer's requirements and accordingly issue an corrigendum or an addendum uh, that makes sure that the corrections or the changes have been incorporated in employer's requirement rather than relying on the contractor's proposal during execution. So this has to be kept in mind while bidding for the projects. Now, under the design clause, uh, design obligations clause of uh, yellow book and uh, silver book, there is there is a, there's an elaborate discussion on the training as built and operation and maintenance manual. Now, you need to check this contract provisions, especially employer's requirement in these cases here. Now, though you might have completed your work, unless the training as built and operation and maintenance manual is submitted, and, and this can slightly vary from one uh, contract form to other contract form, you need to even look at the special conditions of the contract or the particular conditions of the contract. And uh, this becomes, a requirement or a prerequisite for taking over works under section 10.1. If you remember in the previous edition, we were talking about the uh, the uh, taking over of works and taking over of work marks the, um, uh, the, 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 the closure of the contractor's responsibilities, uh, at least to a great extent. There might be some amount of work that might be left out, but that will uh, not actually hinder the employer's use uh, or the intended purpose. Now, if this training as built operation and maintenance manuals are not submitted on time, then this could prolong 10.1 and this might have an impact on the project completion, liquidated damages, penalties, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So need to be very careful in this case. And also as discussed in the previous uh, uh, session, uh, FIDIC has this work and section requirement and whatever that is defined for the work completion, the same is applicable for the section completion also. So if there's any requirement that has to be satisfied in terms of training as built and operation and maintenance manual for a section, and if that is not done, you might still be subjected to an LD for the given section. So you need to be very careful with respect to fulfillment of obligations, which in which this is also an important part of it. Now, technical standards regulations to be followed as applicable on the base date, that is 28 days prior to the last date of the submission of the tender. And in the event of any change in the technical standards regulations, 
with respect to that of the base date, then a change in law provision can be uh, employed under um, Section 13 variations and adjustments. And you could as well look for um, some kind of um, um, reimbursement of additional expenses or employer might look for some reimbursement of savings of the contractor because of the changes in the technical standards and regulations. Now, one thing that's important here is in most of the uh, Indian contracts, at least, um, whenever you're putting up a claim under change in law, it is very important to ensure that the claim is supported with documents regarding the reimbursement requirements. That is, if there's any slips or if there's any actual expenses incurred, that needs to be substantiated because it's a kind of a reimbursement and there is it cannot be done on some kind of a formula or, or some kind of a, of, a, of, a, of a very vague calculations. So this is very important because there are so many cases where though contractor was entitled for um, a change in law claim, they could not get anything because they could not substantiate the change in law claim with the actual expenses that they've incurred as a result of the change in law. Right. Um, now coming to Red Book. Now, some of you might think that where does design come in Red Book? Because in Red Book, in principle, the employer is expected to provide the designs or provide the engineering inputs to the contractor. However, uh, there is a specific requirement uh, under the contract. Uh, so wherein you have, th there might, the employer might require a contractor to, uh, to take up a certain portion of the work as a design and build part. It's a kind of a mini design and build provision uh, within, a, uh, within a Red Book contract. Now, this is very important because uh, sometimes uh, we might um, overlook this requirement and this might be, and, and one more important thing is, where will this requirement of contractors design be mentioned? Okay, there is a there is a general conditions of contract has this requirement that there might be a requirement by the employer to for a contractor's design, but where exactly this technical details of this design requirement will be mentioned, and and that usually comes under specification because in a red book contract, there's nothing like something like an employer's requirement, the way we have it in silver book or yellow book, because silver book or yellow book is a, a lot of thrust is given for the fitness for purpose. That is, uh, uh, that is an obligation that is put up on the contractor. But here in case of Red Book, in the event employer wants uh, a certain portion to be designed and uh, designed by the contractor, uh, specification is the route that the employer might use. So uh, contractors should be aware of the specific, specific requirements and the specifications. Uh, and it might also happen certain times that uh, an employer might indicate a design requirement as a part of the drawings issued by the employer. Though it is not wrong, uh, FIDIC guide recommends employers to issue, uh, to, to, to recommend any design requirements to specification because drawings might have many details and the requirements of design might, they might, they might there's a good chance for the contractors to overlook this requirement leading to host of claims and counterclaims and things like that. So the, the, it's important for the employer to clearly define such requirements, especially in Red Book, because it is generally not expected to carry on the design obligation in a red book. Now, again, uh, if there is a design, it should meet the requirements of fitness for purpose. And there is a turnkey effect that is for the portion for which the contractor is expected to take up the design responsibility. So that entire thing that we saw in the turnkey responsibilities would get extended to this, the smaller portion of the contract, uh, which is uh, on which, which is the obligation, where design is an obligation of the uh, contractor. So again, the variation under turnkey, so if it's a turnkey, unless and until there is a change in the intended scope of work or in change in this original scope of work, no claims would be entertained by the employer. So please be very careful. If there is a smaller design portion in the red book also, the, the, the same stringent requirements of silver book and or yellow book would be applicable. Most probably yellow book would be applicable on this portion, which is subjected to design. Then. Uh, again, as built documentation, o and manuals should be submitted by the contractor under contractor's document for the portion where the contractor takes up the design. But one thing that we need to keep in mind is that um, the, the Red Book doesn't have much details about the procedures to deal with contractor's documents. Unlike there is a dedicated 5.2 clause in silver and yellow, Red Book does not have such a dedicated clause. But in effect, under under the, under the, the Red Book clause number four, uh, you have the uh, two couple of paragraphs on what is expected out of the contractor when design is in the contractor scope, but not as detailed as in a silver book. And if required, this can be agreed between the parties as a part of the employee's requirement for the portion where the design is being performed. 
Now again, this is linked to 10.1 for taking over of works and sections. So that is important. Uh, one more interesting aspect in this is that uh, this the when when the scope of design is with the contractor for a particular portion in red book, uh, it is important that the contractor incorporates design that is necessary for the engineer to coordinate. And this is very important, especially in works like mechanical, electrical and plumbing, where there will be a lot of interface requirements. And this is where many times the battery limits, if not defined properly, can lead to a lot of scope creep or a gap in the scope wherein certain portions of the work might be left unattended or there can be um, 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 uh, or, or oversupply of certain materials by uh, multiple parties who for between whom the scope is getting uh, overlap. So uh, the contractors is contract is expected to supply necessary information for the engineer to coordinate and ensure that the overall requirements of the employer is being uh, catered to. And for the portion for which the contractor is designing, the contractor is responsible for design. But there is an explicit clause that protects the contractor that uh, for the overall design and specification for the permanent works, yes, contractor is still not responsible for that. But for this portion, yes, contractor is responsible. So to, just to summarize uh, whatever we have discussed, uh, when it comes to red, a silver book and yellow book design obligations, elaborately dealt under the clause number five. And the most important thing that we need to keep in mind is that the moment the design is under the contractor, the fitness for purpose comes into picture. If there is any employer's requirement, uh, if, whenever there is any error in employer's requirement, it becomes very important for the contractor to highlight this error uh, within the time as specified in the contract. And if you don't do that, you might not get any sort of cost and time compensation under 1.9 or 4.7 or even under uh, 5.2. That's very important. Uh, then um, uh, it is uh, in Silver Book, of course, in Silver Book, uh, we don't have this. Um, uh, the, uh, of course, I, I forgot to tell you one thing that in Silver Book, there are certain exceptions um, uh, in in uh, in case of employer's error. Uh, in case of um, let me just uh, go back to that slide. Yeah, uh, in Silver Book, there are around four bullet points which has been mentioned under clause number five point one, where um, uh, there employers in in the event of employer's error in in certain aspects like employers. Um, um, intended purpose definition or uh, data or portions which cannot be verified by the contractor or um, if it is something that is ultimate responsibility or what, what FIDIC calls it as immutable responsibility of the employer then still employer is responsible for the correctness of such documents but it's quite limited not as elaborate as what we have in a yellow book uh, so these are there there's some protection is there in silver book but more or less in silver book it's important to note that employer is not responsible for the error and contractor shall be very careful with respect to this. And lastly, with respect to Red Book, uh, its contractors should be aware of the of the mini design portion within the Red Book. And uh, if uh, this is something that is ignored, uh, then there can be issues on uh, on the meeting the fitness for purpose requirements and uh, and the, the claims that follow such uh, issues. Right. Thank you very much. And um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Murali, for your presentation. It was excellent. Um, we will now take a short break, and after that, David's going to be up, and he's going to um, give us a presentation on the termination uh, issues regarding the contracts. So, 15-minute quick break, and I think we can all uh, sort of uh, replenish ourselves and refresh ourselves and be back in about 15 minutes. Thanks. Yeah, thanks.
Hi, Gracious. Hi, David. All right, so the last for the best. Yeah. The best for the last. <laughs> um, so uh, David's now going to, you know, talk about termination under FIDIC contracts. And that's one thing that excites everybody, especially dispute lawyers. So uh, I'm going to leave the stage to you now. Gracious, thank you very much. Um, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to look at termination under FIDIC red, yellow, and silver books. Um, essentially, the same principles apply to all three of those forms of contract. There isn't any substantive difference in the approach to termination. Um, of course, there's no en engineer under the silver book, but it, it, it doesn't really affect the principles in relation to termination. Now, um, just uh, and thank you, Gracious. Gracious is very kindly going to um, deal with my slides for me. So I'll just ask for the next one when we're ready. Just before we get into them, we might just reflect on, well, why why might you want to terminate a, a, a contract? Um, I think essentially two reasons. I mean, most obviously, I suppose, because your counterparty is not performing and it's so seriously not performing um, that you think the best course available is to actually bring it all to an end and um, finish off with somebody else if you're an employer or just to get out and go and do something else if you're the contractor. Um, so non-performance by counterparty is, is the first thing. But there's also a more commercial reason that may be that the market has moved against you or you've just realized actually you've made a bad bargain. Um, this is happening, I think, more and more at the moment in inflationary times. Contractors uh, are getting a lot of inflation down the supply chain, finding their costs are much higher than they felt uh, and uh, or predicted and uh, finding the contract is no longer profitable and want out. <clears throat> um, then on the employer side, it's, it's maybe that market conditions have moved and the project's no longer uh, desirable or, or profitable for them or predicted to be profitable. So equally, they may want out. Um, and in, in these sort of market conditions, it may be that either party is looking to see if they can use the contractual provisions to get out of the contract in the former case of non-performance, then it's more straightforward. They just want out because uh, things are just going badly. Anyway, let, let's um, look at the next slide, please, and get into this. Um, I've called termination the nuclear option. Uh, and it is, um, as you'll appreciate, a very serious step indeed to take for either party to bring a contract to an end, particularly the kind of substantial contracts that tend to be made under the FIDIC terms. Um, so it it really is a big deal and one that you have to be immensely careful about uh, on either side. Nuclear is quite a good word for it because it, in a sense it is the ultimate deterrent, um, the ability of um, either party to terminate if the other is not performing um, means that the the party who is terminated, the guilty party, if you like, the party in default, if we're talking about default termination, it, it's going to be expensive for the defaulter. Um, if you're the uh, employer and you've got a right to terminate the contractor, then you're going to be looking to charge the contractor for the costs of finishing the works by somebody else. So that's going to be expensive for the contractor. On the other side, if a contractor's got a right to terminate, um, then it's going to be expensive for an employer because he's going to be paying the contractor the profits that that contractor would have made on finishing the work. So he's going to be paying all that out, um, but he hasn't actually got the work. And he'll have to pay, if he still wants the work, he'll have to pay some other contractor and pay their profits as well. So it is a deterrent. It does um, give an incentive to both parties to actually perform. And of course, it also offers an escape route from, from your non-performing counterparty and perhaps from a bad bargain. <clears throat> now, we're going to look at the FIDIC terms but uh, and the rights that arise to, to terminate. But the thing that uh, FIDIC won't tell you and um, the FIDIC forms won't tell you and what most contracts don't tell you is, is what happens if you get it wrong. So they set out uh, often at great length when you have a right to terminate uh, and how you exercise that right. But they don't tell you what happens if 
actually, when you tried to do that, you were wrong uh, and you didn't have a right. Um, so that goes back to the, the general law. Uh, and what it means effectively is if you get it wrong uh, and you purport to exercise a right and you haven't got that right, then that's when it can blow you up because you will probably yourself be the party who's now in default and in uh, under the general common law be in repudiatory breach of contract yourself and liable to be terminated and, and to pay uh, damages. And it's important, therefore, to bear in mind um, that in, in these situations, and these situations are often disputed, um, usually disputed, I might say as much as that, uh, to bear in mind what happens if you get it wrong. Uh, and um, getting your um, termination right means getting it right in substance, that you've got the right, uh, and it means getting it procedurally right. <clears throat> so if the contract says the procedure you have to follow to, to terminate the contract when you've got a right, then it's very important that you do actually follow that procedure. And I'd, it's for that reason that I put the last line on this slide. I think that any party who is contemplating uh, the termination of, of a contract, certainly anything of any substance, should take legal advice because it is something that needs to be very well prepared. Uh, it may be that it's uh, something that has to be prepared over quite a lengthy period of time to, to lay the appropriate groundwork. But you have to be very sure factually of your, of your grounds and also legally under the contract exactly what you are relying on, whether you're entitled to do that, uh, and exactly how you are going to carry out mechanically the uh, termination when you come to do it. And so a great deal of preparation and care uh, is, is needed. Let's go on to the um, next slide, please. Um, we come then to, to FIDIC, um, and these really are the five headings of types of termination that exist under the FIDIC forms. Um, firstly, there are two types of termination that are available to the, to the employer. Um, an employer can, can terminate because the contract is in default, and the contract we'll see is going to tell us which types of default um, en enable termination. But an employer can also terminate for convenience, uh, as it's uh, called. So if the employer wants to terminate, um, it can, and that might be the, the bad bargain situation. Um, the contractor doesn't have that equivalent right. So two rights there for the employer alone. Then the contractor does have the right to terminate for employer default. Uh, and then two things that apply to, to both of them, there is provision under these forms for termination for what's now called prolonged exceptional event um, in um, many uh, contracts and formally and in some parts of the world, that's force majeure. It's the same thing effectively, but either party can terminate for prolonged exceptional event. And then we have termination at law as well, termination for repudiatory breach of the contract. That right uh, is there. The general principle of the common law is that if you want to exclude the right to terminate um, under the common law, then you've got to exclude it quite expressly. Uh, and if you don't, then that, that right will be there. And the contractual rights are, are something that exist on top of it. Um, and these fitting forms do not exclude um, that right. So unless they're amended to do so, they don't exclude it. it, it it's there. The cases on looking at whether um, there's exclusion of um, the underlying legal right um, take a fairly strict approach. So you really do need quite plain express words uh, to, to, to achieve that exclusion. So those are the um, types of, um, of, of termination rights that we're going to look at. And so let's, let's look at termination for employer default first. Um, this is all necessarily going to have to be relatively high level, but I'll try and focus on some of the um, highlights. Um, and um, if we can just go back to the, the first uh, of the slide, slide four, that's it, gracious, thank you. Um, <clears throat> relatively high level, but I'm going to try and focus on some of the um, main um, grounds that perhaps should be in, in focus, and also some tactical issues that arise for, for parties uh, looking to, to terminate. So it's clause 15 that deals with the uh, employer's right to terminate. And it's clause 15.2, which sets out 
a list of the grounds on which uh, a notice of termination can be given. Um, and there are there are eight of those grounds. Now, um, this is a two stage process. So the first notice, um, first termination notice is a is actually a notice of intention to terminate. And it can be given on these on the, one of these eight grounds. And they are failing to comply with a notice to correct. And we're going to have a look at that in a bit more detail, what a notice to correct is. Um, a determination under clause 3.7 that may be made by the with the engineer or a DA failing to comply with a, a disputed adjudication board decision. And if those constitute a material breach of the contractor's obligations, then the termination right um, arises. Um, and then other ones are uh, if the contractor abandons or shows an intention not to continue with performance um, or fails to proceed with due ex addition without and without delay fails to comply with notice of rejection of um, defective work that is fails to provide a performance security subcontracts all of the works or insolvency and corruption that's the the list um, of uh, matters that can enable an employer to serve that first notice that I intend to terminate the the contract then what happens is the contractor's got 14 days to remedy that um and if it doesn't remedy it within 14 days, then the employer can give a second notice terminating the contract immediately. So that's the that's the um, basic two stage process of it. Uh, and but that is a procedure which, as I say, must be followed. Otherwise, the termination is going to be invalid. Um, now. Uh, it's important, therefore, that uh, anyone wanting, any employer wanting to um, follow this, studies carefully what the contract says. Clause 1.3 of the contract has got provisions about notices. Uh, there may be more put into individual contracts in the contract data about um, addresses and so on, um, and exactly who has got to be notified. All of that has to be studied to make sure that you get your notices um, served in the in the right way. That there are uh, cases and uh, the, uh, that have looked at this, whether the notice is good or bad. Uh, if your notice is is bad, um, then it's your termination is going to be invalid, and you can be in repudiatory breach. So, uh, really important to get this right. Um, the leading case on <clears throat> on all of this is uh, an English, uh, really the leading case in the common law, law world. It's a case called Obriscon uh, in the English uh, High Court uh, a few years ago. It said that you do take a common sense view of it. It is it is uh, imperative that the notice provisions are, are followed to make sure that the contractor does actually it was an employer termination, but whichever way around it is that that there is actual notice uh, given. Um, and uh, so, if there's some technical um, error in it, it may be that that is overlooked by the courts. But there are other decisions. Uh, there's one in New Zealand which uh, insists that there must be meticulous um, compliance with notice provisions, otherwise the termination will be invalid. So it can vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction as to how strict uh, compliance is. But <clears throat> my advice would have to be that comply very strictly. You're taking a risk um, if you're not. There's one instance came up, I know, of, of um, what, what do you do if, for example, the contract says you've got to serve notice on a particular address, uh, the company, in fact, uh, has moved from that address, uh, and uh, there's there's nobody at the old empty office building. Well, what do you do then? Uh, I think my advice would be to serve the notice on on both the old and the new addresses, so that you can, although serving on the old address is effectively um, not going to have any real effect. You are seen to have complied in form with the contract as well as in substance with the contract in, in bringing the notice to the attention of the party at, it, at its new address. Anyway, the tactics really are to be very well prepared about this. The other point that I'm just going to develop a little bit more is it's it's important when you're, or it's good advice when you are trying to terminate a contract to rely on as many grounds as you can it may be that one of your grounds really stands out as the, the substance of it and what's really um, been um, damaging your position. Um, but really, some of these grounds uh, can be more disputatious than others. Uh, and if you can rely on something that 
is uh, more factual, then it's much best to do so. But anyway, give yourself the, the broadest grounds that you, you can. And then if we can go to the next slide, please, I'm just going to focus on <laughs> one of these grounds, because I think it is one that tactically can be wise for employers to, to focus on. It is something that arises uh, under Clause 15.1. It's, it's one of the lists we've just looked at, the, the so-called notice to correct. Um, uh, and you serve under this under Clause 15.1. And, and the employer has a right to serve a notice on, on the contractor um, requiring the contractor to make uh, good any failure uh, to remedy uh, any obligation under the contract that it's failing to carry out. Now, um, there are dozens of, of obligations uh, on the contractor uh, under the contract, and this clause gives a right to serve uh, a notice uh, requiring the contractor to uh, actually, in quite striking words, make good and remedy um, the failure to comply with that uh, obligation. Um, <clears throat> interesting words, make good and remedy. What if you can make good but can't remedy? Um, is there going to, in the end, be an automatic right to, to terminate because you can't do both of those things? Um, make good probably means stop um, the not complying with your obligations and start complying with them. But what about remedy? Does that mean put right any damage that's been done by failing to comply with the obligation? Well, you may not, might not be able to do that. So um, disputed um, words there, what do they mean? Do they mean you can't actually serve a notice in in those circumstances because it's impossible to make good and remedy or does it mean you can serve it and actually it will work through to mean that there is automatically going to be a a, a right to terminate because it's uh, the contractor won't be able to comply so uh, again matters that need to be very carefully looked at um, <clears throat> but there is a possibility of serving these notices what it has to to do if you if you serve one of these it has to describe the contractor's failure it has to identify the obligation that uh, is not being complied with, and it has to specify a time for remedy, and that time has to be reasonable. Um, and um, whether a time is reasonable or not, that needs careful thought. It'll depend partly on the nature of the failure, how long it really will take to correct it, taking a fair view of it. Um, and therefore, you've got to think about what is the work that would be required to, to do the remedy. Um, so, uh, again, um, careful, careful thought and advice needed as to how much time you, you put in your notice to correct for the contractor to, to make good and remedy. Um, you can't just state uh, any old time, because if you do that and it's not reasonable, then that may well make um, this notice in, invalid. Anyway, if you serve one, uh, then the contractor's got to respond immediately with the measures that he intends to take and the time at which he's going to start taking them to um, to, to, to remedy the problem. Um, now, if we just go on to the next slide a bit more on, on this, um, this device, the, this ground of termination, because I think it it, it is um, in many ways an attractive ground for an employer to rely on. Um, let, let's bear in mind that, um, again, that termination situations are usually disputed, um, that you, you can have, for example, um, an employer saying, well, a contractor has abandoned the works or is failing to proceed. Uh, on the other hand, the contractor will be saying, um, well, I may not be proceeding with the works, but that's because you haven't given me relevant access or you haven't given me relevant information uh, and I've got a, a delay case. So, um, uh, and in fact, you are preventing me from um, completing the works and um, I, I, I'm the party entitled to terminate. So you, you've got usually this disputed situations. I think the um, attraction of the notice to correct provisions for the employer is that it gives an opportunity to build up a broad based case, perhaps starting with correspondence and then perhaps a series of notices to correct um that really paint a picture uh of continuing default by the uh, contractor and potentially failures to remedy some of those may be more serious than others but at least you can build a broader case paint a picture of continuing default by a contractor and then when if and when you get into arbitration which is not uncommon when when you get disputed 
terminations, then you have got that narrative uh, story to tell the arbitrators of this this continuing default by the contractor. So I think it's a, 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 a good way to put it. Um, now, bear in mind, though, that um, th thanks to a change in the um, wording in, in FIDIC in 2017, so this clause was amended between 1999 and 2017, um, the failure um, to correct has got to be a material breach uh, of the contract. And that was a change that actually came as a result of that Obruskan case that I, I referred to. Um, which said that without the wording, what it actually meant was that the failures, the failure to 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 make good and remedy had to be significant, um, and that it had to be something that had actually already happened, not something that was anticipated. So as a result of that, uh, I think it was because of that case that the wording got changed to say, well, it had to be a um, a material breach of the contract that that um, had occurred. Um, uh, and uh, so you do have to show that. But despite that requirement, and despite the fact that maybe not all of your notices are material, still worth serving them and building up that um, um, picture um, and, and that case with perhaps multi-layered, making it uh, a stronger if you get into a dispute situation. So if we can just move on then to uh, the consequences of uh, Clause 15, employer termination. Um, it's clause 15, three uh, and four sets out uh, what happens um, if an employer validly terminates under this clause. Um, just bear in mind what contract terminated actually means. It doesn't mean that it ceases to exist for all purposes. What it really means is that um, the contractor no longer has a right to do the work or to get paid for it. But the contract, that's what's terminated. But the contract actually remains in being in the sense that it tells you what then happens after that right to do the work and get paid gets gets ended because it, it then goes on to the secondary obligations that arise about working out what the party's entitlements are. So what Clause 15.3 says, um, uh, and perhaps I should preface all this by saying, well, the employer, first of all, can eject the contractor from the site if the contractor doesn't go. But in terms of payment, um, what happens that the engineer is has, is required to determine the value of the work that's been done uh, and any other sums that might be due to the contractor. Uh, and But clause 15.4 says the, the employer can withhold that payment until uh, it's established its costs, loss, and damage, including, and this will be the, the real point, the additional costs of completing the works. So there'll be money due to the contractor, more than likely, for, for, for work, work done. Um, but the employer is entitled to work out its entitlements and work out the balance, and nothing has to be paid until that is known. Um, and what the employer is entitled to is its additional cost to complete any other loss and damage it might have suffered, and it'll be entitled to any delay damages um, if termination is after the date for the time for completion. There'll be, in principle, there'll be an accrued right to delay damages from the time for completion through to the termination. But of course, um, what you then get into in disputed termination situations and in arbitration, you get the contractor saying, ah, yes, um, but I was entitled to a, a massive extension of time to, to way beyond the date for termination. Uh, and that will all be part of the of everything being disputed following the, the, the termination. Um, the, bear in mind the subject to clause 20, um, that that does matter. The employer does have these entitlements, but it has to put that claim in. It has to give notice of, of the claim. There then has to be an engineer's decision if there's no agreement. Uh, and if then the there's a challenge to the engineer's decision, then there has to be a DAB decision. Uh, and then if that's not accepted as final, well, you've got to go to arbitration. So that whole machinery has to be gone through for the employer to en enforce its claim. Um, though it has been found that the fact that um, uh, 
uh, the, the, whether the termination is rightful or wrongful has gone to a DAB that will cover the working out of the financial entitlements um, that flow from it, um, be, be it rightful or wrongful. So the fact that you haven't put the money before the DAB may not matter if the principle of termination has been before them. There certainly have been findings to that effect. But again, all difficult and possibly disputed items that that need really um, a lot a lot of thought. So that's um, a view of the employer's entitlement to um, terminate for default. Um, now let's go and have a look at um, termination for convenience, um, which is another right of the employer. And as I adverted to earlier, the contractor has no e equivalent right. Um, what the contractor does have if the employer um, uh, chooses to exercise this right um, is that it gets compensated effectively. I mean, the wording's all a bit different and, and um, there's some detail here, but in principle, it gets the value of its work done and it gets its lost profit or any other loss and damage that it's suffered. Um, so it's as, it's as if uh, it had um, a, a right to terminate for, for breach. Um, so it's not... Um, it, it's not a, a sort of um, golden ticket for the employer. Um, it, it is a way out, um, but he's got to pay his way out effectively. Um, it, it, it's, it's, this was quite a big change between the 1999 and 2017 forms. Uh, and I appreciate that there's still quite a lot of use of the 1999 forms uh, around. Um, so in 2017, the employer became entitled to uh, complete by a replacement contractor. So it can actually terminate for convenience. I'm terminating convenience. And, and the motive can be they just want to use somebody else. You couldn't do that under the 1999 form. Equally, there was another side to the deal under the 1999 form. The contractor didn't get its loss of profit. Um, so it's 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 a that was quite a radical change, um, at least in in the form of the contract. Whether it uh, actually changes in reality is is perhaps harder to know. Um, given the costs of compensating the first contractor, it may be that, that employers don't really use it for that reason. The, these clauses exist around the world in various forms of contract. They're, they're popular in the United States and get used a fair bit. Um, in the UK, our experience is that they are um, they're very rarely used, um, and uh, even under difficult market conditions, they, they seem to be very rarely used and quite often get deleted. Um, you all know better than I um, how much they're, they're used in India, whether they're, they're de deleted or not. Sometimes in some parts of the world, you get people arguing that you can't use these clauses um, uh, in bad faith or, or in a, a way that's not not cooperative. So if you do have a contract that's got a um, some kind of clause saying that, that the parties um, w will act in good faith uh, or in some form of trust and cooperation be between each other, then you can get arguments that they are a fetter on the use of, of this clause. Although, uh, again, although it's rare in, in the UK, the view here is that, it, that they, generally speaking, don't fetter them because it's an express right. Um, so that's the notes at, at the bottom. Anyway, that's another employer's right, but not contractor's right. But let's just have a look now um, at what the contractor's rights actually are. Um, and uh, so if we go to the next slide, please, gracious, thank you. It's clause 16.2 that sets out a, a list of the grounds that entitle the contractor um, to, to terminate. Um, uh, and uh, it, it's again, it's a long list. There are actually ten, ten things um, that that enable him to do so, and, and it's the same um, basic setup as it is for employer default. Um, the contractor finding that uh, one of these situations applies can give a notice of intention to terminate the contract, and then if the failure is not remedied within. 14 days, then there is actually a no, a, a, an entitlement to serve a notice terminating. And all of those points about having to get the procedure right, 
they apply just as much to the contractor uh, as they do to the employer. So if if you 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 are or you're advising a contractor, then you really have to pour all over these procedural provisions and get them right, uh, because in the same way as an employee, a contractor can be in repudiatory breach for um, purporting to terminate when it doesn't have a right to do so, either in substance or because it's got the procedure wrong. Um, so then if we go to the next slide, uh, please, I, I just wanted to say a little bit about um, tactics here. Um, and it's it's perhaps the same for the contractor as it is for the employer, um, that you have to be very cautious in... in um, exercising or purporting to exercise these rights and I think uh, for a contractor that there may be that there's <laughs> that there's no there is no equivalent of that notice to correct possibility that the employer had which as I was saying offered the possibility of building a somewhat broader based case um, the contractor may have to think slightly differently because it doesn't it doesn't have that what it can perhaps do is again try to rely on objective grounds for termination if it possibly can. Um, so on that list, we don't need to go back to the list, but there are there are failures to pay. So uh, failing to give, um, failure to issuing a, a payment certificate within time and failing to pay on a certificate, those are grounds of, of termination. So if there's any possibility of relying on an objective ground like that, then as a contractor, it's always good to do so. What tends to happen, <coughs> um, and both, both parties tend to fall into this trap, is there's focus on the grounds of termination that are not proceeding um, with, with proper dispatch under the, under the contract uh, on the one side, uh, and then not fulfilling obligations um, uh, by the employer on, on the other side. And you just get into arguments about whose fault it is that this contract is going wrong, that it's in massive delay, uh, uh, and so on. So um, rather than getting into those highly disputed situations only, you'll have those probably, but as a contractor, if you can if you can stand on something objective as well, then you greatly um, um, strengthen your, your position. Um, uh, so that I think is is the um, the advice for um, contractors tactically. Um, there's one um, one question there that also has to be focused on quite quite often. Um, my second line there: Does the breach by the engineer qualify as a breach by the employer? You've got to look quite carefully at what what's happened. The position is probably that when the engineer is acting administratively, and so. Um, issuing information and instructions and so on to the contractor, then that and the, and if there's been some failure there, some breach there, that probably does qualify as a breach by the employer. But the situation where the um, engineer is is certifying or failing to certify or failing to certify independently and fairly, which so often is the actual complaint, then that probably isn't attributable to to the employer. But all these things are fact sensitive and sensitive perhaps to individual um, amended clauses of the contract. So again, have to be looked at quite closely. Um, then next slide, um, please, as we're, we're coming to the end here, we'll just go through a few more points. The consequences um, of contractor default, contractor termination for default, um, the performance security has got to be given back uh, contractor's got to be paid for the work he's done for plant and materials that have been delivered or to which he's already committed. Um, got to pay for removing the contractor's equipment, any staff repatriation costs, and the big one at the end, pay any loss of profit or other loss or damage as a result of termination. So contractor gets paid what he would have made on the contractor anyway. Uh, and that obviously is the fair result. One wrinkle to that is there is a decision that says, um, what's other loss or damage, but vague that. And one thing that may be difficult to get uh, and the decision on is, is um, overheads on work that hasn't been carried out may not get that. So that's a wrinkle that, that you might have to look at. Those words, other loss or damage, are a bit vague, may get, may get um, interpreted differently in different um, jurisdictions uh, as well. But in principle, that's um, the, uh, the way it works. 
And then um, next slide, uh, please, gracious, the prolonged exceptional event. I don't think I sit, need to say m much about this. It's the it's force measure. And if such an event prevents the work being carried out for a, a continuous period of 84 days or aggregated periods of 140 days, either party can um, terminate, uh, in which case the performance security gets given back uh, and um, the engineer uh, determines what is payable for the work done, plant and materials, and other reasonable costs incurred, removal of plant and equipment and repatriation. So its costs effectively get paid uh, in those uh, events. Um, sometimes those uh, that clause gets amended just to allow the risk to lie where it falls and everyone just just, just walks away. But the, the contract, the approach is cost, but cost rather than, than, than profit. And then um, finally, just a slide on the termination at, at law. Uh, if we go to slide um, 13, uh, I've made the point that common law rights remain unless they're excluded uh, and they're not excluded. Um, a repudiatory breach is one that is often said to go to the root of the contract. So it's um, breach of a uh, what's called a, a condition, a, a important clause of the contract, or it's a serious breach of a lesser clause, or it's a refusal to to perform, and that's why um, terminating when you haven't got a right to do so uh, will be a repudiatory breach because it's saying I'm not I'm not performing anymore. Um, so you can appreciate, I think, um, that um, well, there's yeah, going back to this and understanding this for another second. The best tactic, and you do have to be very strategic about terminating, whichever side you're on, is to found your termination on the contract and in accordance with the law, if you can do that, because you might well have both rights concurrently. You can do that in principle if, the, if you've got both rights, but there has to be no inconsistency between them. So if the consequences of the um, common law of the contractual right are different from the common law, then you may not be able to do that. Um, and again, it, this is something very much that legal advice is needed on to how to frame your your termination notice. But if you can do it, it's obviously stronger to rely on, on both rights. So my last slide and my overall message to, to terminators, if I can call them that, potential terminators, I think you can appreciate some of the the difficulties uh, and complications and nuances that can arise uh, if you are wishing to terminate a contract and just how tactical you have to be. So be careful and be prepared. Thank you very much. Okay. I think we can now uh, sort of run through some of these questions that uh, we've had. Um, and since Geraldine started first, I should probably get her back on track um, to ensure that she's still around <laughs> in mind, body and spirit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, Geraldine, one question that I had was regarding this timeline. And as you were speaking, it really struck me that you know, as an employer, you don't really think much or you are rather oblivious to the timeline, you know, that is quite extensive uh, and the time that a contractor waits for payments to be made. Um, what would you recommend that a contractor should do, you know, to give uh, his best shot in ensuring that he gets his money on time? Because that's very essential for him, given, his, given the cash flow in the present world, we post COVID or during COVID has been a serious issue for most contractors. Sure. The, the first thing to say is almost a repeat of what I said during my uh, little slot, which was I would definitely want the contractor to uh, encourage the employer to agree to shorter payment terms. That probably is the most important thing to do, to be waiting from the 1st of April to the 27th of May, I just think is far, far, far too long. Um, if you could get it down so that the total period wasn't 56 days, it was somewhere more between 20 to 30 days. That's the very first thing to do. Once the contract is signed, actually, you are stuck with those payment terms. But there are certainly things that the contractor can do to encourage payment on time. 
The first thing would be, again, I, I touched on this during the course of my talk, when the contractor puts their monthly statement in, they need to actually help the engineer by putting in evidence to show that X amount of work has been done or X materials have been delivered through photographs, programs, marked up drawings, definitely worth doing. Mm -hmm. Making sure you send it in the right way, again, which is, of course, a separate subject to this. Also, I would want the contractor to check with the engineer that they've actually physically received the application. In that uh, certification period, making sure that the engineer has got everything they need. So in other words, the contractor should be extraordinarily helpful and check, does the engineer need anything else? Once the certification date has been reached, literally nine o'clock the day after, the contractor should be making sure that they have the certificate. And if they haven't got the certificate, chase it. And then also the engine, uh, sorry, the contractor needs to make sure that they know how the employer is set up in the accounts department. So mm. what bits of paper does the accounts department need to press the magic payment button? Um, is it the case that the engineer's certificate is enough? Does it also need, for bureaucracy purposes, is there some kind of internal procedure as well? And then as we're getting nearer the payment date, I'd also want the contractor to be checking with the accounts department, is everything on track for payment? Are we going to receive it on the actual payment date? Is there anything outstanding? What I certainly would not want the contractor to do is issue the monthly statement on the 1st of April and then only start worrying about it on the 28th of May when there's a big blank hole in their bank account, when they could have done some very proactive actions during the course of that period. So the contractor can definitely help themselves in this period. Right, uh, and since you mentioned bureaucracy, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, as somebody who represents the government quite often, I've always found that the independent financial advisors, you know, the payment department, let's say, yep. um, often find it difficult to make a certain payment when they see that the project is obviously in delay and the EOT application is still pending determination. Um, and, you know, the employer is a little confused. I mean, we are still waiting on a determination, but the financial advisor wants a certain LD to be deducted. Um, and the contractor is usually the one who suffers terms of a delay uh, over there because it usually goes back and forth between the employer and his independent financial advisor who keeps sending things back and I wonder if since from the comment you made I wonder should a contractor consider proactively you know and I'm not without prejudice basis sort of deduct um, uh, the amount of LD um, which um, which you know is subject to determination by the engineer do you think oh, that that would not be something that mm -hmm. I would be, um, I'd be comfortable with advising at all. Okay. I, I would imagine an awful lot of contractors would be saying that there's no entitlement to deduct LDs and actually the engineer hasn't done their job in, in certifying. But actually, you know, if, if everybody agrees that there is two weeks LDs to be paid, well, proactively confirming that that is the right amount. I can see that that does have advantages as well. I would say that that would only work in a very limited number of circumstances when everybody is entirely agreed that that is the, the right thing right. to do. So that would be a very unusual set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to sort of do an offshoot to David. Um, you see, no, normally when you when you tender out, uh, the contractor doesn't really have so much leeway in terms of the timeline regarding the payment terms. Um, I wonder, and I've seen certain disputes arising where um, the parties in the minutes, you know, in a certain meeting, agree that we will shorten the timelines um, with the you know 56 days being reduced to let's say 30 days or whatnot. And when disputes arise, suddenly the employers takes the position that you know, the minutes as such never amended the payment terms. Um, well, you see, that was the only practical way that a contractor could approach the employer and sort of you know, have an understanding is by 
working things out in a, in a certain minutes of meetings rather than making a formally amend, you know, amending the contract formally, which bureaucracy might have problems with. Um, what do you suggest uh, in these sort of situations? Do you think the minutes are sufficient to consider the payment terms, you know, amended? Is that workable as a solution? You're muted, by the way. You're muted again. I think you muted yourself. Let me help you. Right. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's more or less impossible to give an in principle uh, one size fits all answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you've if you've just got a, a minute uh, and nothing more, uh, with no amendment and no course of conduct, let's shall, shall we say, let's say that you've got a minute from January. Uh, and in February, the employer wants to go back on it, you're in a pretty weak position as a contractor. Um, if you've got <clears throat> um, maybe a series of minutes uh, and correspondence as well, and I'd recommend you put in um, uh, formal looking letters, uh, if you can't get an actual amendment, then get some uh, official letters in, um, try and get a response, um, get a series of letters, uh, either confirmatory responses or no response is quite good. Mm -hmm. And then um, keep your fingers crossed that you can get the new system working for a while. <laughs> the longer it works like that, mm -hmm. the better. Uh, and then try and also act on the basis that you're getting paid in the shorter time. Uh, let it be known that you're relying on it. Um, so somehow get in some minutes or get in some correspondence that 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 sort of confirms receipt in the in the the now shorter period and that this has enabled you to do something um, right. that you've relied on it that relied on this new system I mean even if it's only having a party I mean I I mean I'm being flippant but but show some reliance on, on the new system then what you're doing uh, is giving yourself the potential to set up an estoppel um, when the employer tries to go back on what it says in the minutes. Now, you can't say that that will work. Uh, all you can say, really, is that the more you have, the better chance you've got that it, that it, that it may work. And that's, that's, as a contractor, I think, what you can do. But, you know, really, if it, pin the employer down, if he says at a meeting with his representatives that he will pay sooner and he's prepared to minute that, then we'll, why will he not do an, an amendment? Mm hmm Right. Um, just to keep the payment issue going, um, you see, generally, there are sometimes uh, issues with cash flow, and especially let's let's take the context of a yellow book. Um, and I, I was I was wondering what comments you would have uh, regarding amendment to payment schedules, um, where let's say you know during and after the COVID onslaught, especially. Um, there was a lot of cash flow issues, and uh, a lot of contractors did try to amend their payment schedules, especially where it's a very front-loaded contract in the sense, you know, you require to at least do, let's say, a good 50 crore worth work in order to be able to get 50 crores. I mean, 50 crores is a huge amount for somebody to, to invest into to be able to get that much amount of money. Um, what, what thoughts do you have regarding amend, amending payment schedules, let's say, after the contract has been signed? And what kind of practical solutions do you think there may be possible? Sure. OK, so the, the starting point would be if you want to change the payment terms post contract, by far the best way is a deed of variation because it's nice and clean and clear and crisp mm -hmm. and it's set out properly for all the parties. I think COVID, it, it, there was, I, I certainly found that there was quite a bit of generosity from employers when COVID hit. And not necessarily that the employees were paying in advance, but they certainly were more flexible on the payment terms. Right. Now, do, into further smaller parts, maybe. Yeah. I, I think that that was a blip. And I think that the generosity in 2020 
when we were all blindsided by COVID did not translate into 2021. And I think the hearts of employers were hardened and the hearts of contractors were hardened down the line to subcontractors in 2021. So I'm kind of describing and hoping actually that COVID 2020 was a once in a lifetime event. And I think we need to go uh, away from thinking about the, the generosity side that was extended at that point. And I would like to go back to if you're going to change payment terms or any other terms in the contract, then I want it done formally. Otherwise, uh, I, I sometimes make a joke with clients and contractors and subcontractors. Uh, not only do you have to engage the likes of one of us on this call, but you might also want to take out a membership with Gamblers Anonymous because that's effectively what you're doing. You, you are gambling with will the generosity extend or will the party say, actually, no, we, we've only done it for those two months for a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. And actually, I, I'm not going to do that again. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to I'm taking quite a hard line here. COVID, no, a blip. You're, right, actually. you're and, quite right, because yeah. I have seen that the employer, especially the employer that I present, has been so generous to the extent of, uh, you know, returning a certain amount of performance bank guarantee as well. That yeah. was actually a government notification that required to reduce the bank guarantee from Absolutely. 10 to 3%. And then payment schedules were amended to break it down further because these are front-loaded contracts. And even though the contractor entered this contract knowing that he had to do so many, so much of investment, um, we still were generous to actually break it down. But yes. we did not see any improvement in terms of the work's progress. No. Anyway, that was a gamble. And I think <laughs> yeah. it really went south for us. Uh, I'm going to quickly jump to Murli and get back to uh, um, the other two. Uh, Murli, you did explain uh, where the employer's requirements go wrong. I mean, in terms of the errors that you find. Um, you've shown how FIDIC navigates us through, you know, 5.1. I was wondering for the for the benefit of our audience, if you could also talk about the relationship between 1.9, which also talks about employers' errors, sure. with 5.1. I mean, is there a certain timeline difference that you would like to emphasize or anything like that, that you know, comes out of these? Right. Uh, yeah. So 5.1 uh, deals with uh, the... The cases uh, five, the 5.1 is just a clause under uh, the obligations of the contractor, wherein uh, it talks about what happens when there is a um, error in the employee's requirement. Uh, but again, that ref, that if you again go back to 1.9, which is a very specific clause on errors in the employee's requirement, uh, you you see that it is tied to 20.1. So they describe the situation which would be a kind of an error, default, or a, or a, or a, some issue with an employee's requirement. Uh, and it is again subject to the uh, extent to which uh, a prudent contractor could have uh, discovered this during the previous stage. And to that extent, it can be adjusted and it will be looked from the point of view of 20.1. Uh, now, this is where, uh, uh, I, I, at least initially for me, when I was uh, when I started looking into these big contracts, I had a problem where uh, when this again. If you look at uh, 5.1, you have this requirement that uh, the notice under 5.1 should be provided within the time that is defined under appendix to tender. Mm -hmm. Now, there can be a possibility that this, say, for example, uh, today is the date of commencement and uh, the contract 5.1 says I need to um, send a notice if I, in case of, I need to scrutinize and send a notice in case there is any uh, error within, say, 14 days from today. Uh, so suppose I fail to do this. Um, and uh, I inform the employer uh, through a notice under 5.1 uh, that uh, there is an error in the specific requirement in the, in the employer's requirement, say after say 20 days. Uh, there would be an uh, that I would be putting up this claim under 20.1, saying that I still have time because there's 28 days uh, the provision that's uh, there under 20.1. But again, that may not be possible because 20.1 requirements are in addition. To the any specific requirements by this uh, by the clause under which a claim is being lodged, whether it is force majeure or whether it is under 1.9 or whether it is under 4.7 setting out requirements. So it's better we uh, we stick to the uh, stricter of the two provisions. 
so you need to be aware and um, and go in for the tighter one so that you don't end up in trouble at the same time in case the employer's requirement um in case the requirement under 5 point is more than 28 days it's better not to rely on that and uh, and submit the notice within the requirement of 28 days so so that is important that the contractor does that so that they don't get into trouble later right uh, but moving to like what should a contractor i mean and i think 5.1 or 1.9 says experienced contractor right right, right. um should an experienced contractor be looking for in an employer's requirement you see when when the tender appendix does mention a very limited number of days like 28 mm. days or 30 days or whatever mm. i want it, it seems quite impractical for a for a contractor to be able to verify right. um the employer's requirement especially where the employer's requirement holds various values like a flood level right. or a certain piling uh, you know information like the geotech info that right. the employer for whatever reason has provided in the employer's requirement mm. um so i think at some point the contractor just has to go along it would right. seem so because of the limited number of days right. um you know how does this outplay exactly i mean because the employer is always ready to say well you had two weeks or three right. weeks or four weeks to do this but how does the employer a contractor an experienced one goes around verifying each of these details in the employer's requirement is there right. some sort of a safe uh, safety net for the contractor for these sort of situations uh, so i can tell you what happened in one of the projects where i was working earlier uh, the, we had a clause very similar to what is there in fedic with respect to pointing out the errors in employer's requirement though the particular contract was a heavily amended form of fedic contract but rather this clause was spared of the amendments uh, so uh, the contract said that any technical information that in that particular contract it was called rely upon information that's provided by the employer uh, should we should respond to it within Let's say 14 days from the date of uh, issue of that particular rely upon uh, information. So what happened in the project was within uh, within uh, even right after the first day of the contract becoming uh, coming into force, uh, the employer dumped around 2,500 drawings uh, uh, on us and uh, just gave it to us. So at that particular point of time, we were not very uh, like any. We, we took that as any other project where we typically. Um, find out the issues raise a request for information from the employer only just before the work was actually started now in these 2500 drawings that were supplied to us by the employer there were some of the mechanical electrical and plumbing drawings which were absolutely not required in the initial stage of the project so we simply parked that aside we were focusing on those drawings that were required for the initial execution in the project and we completely missed it and later when the real work started we we started pointing out errors to the employer and and that's where the employer said that you should have done it much earlier within 14 days of the uh, contract uh, so I, in my opinion in in all such cases the best thing would be that uh, see as a contractor i would know what are my limits and what is practical and what is not practical within the the initial duration 14 days or 28 days whatever that is provided it is important that we write to the employer and tell what is the extent to which we have reviewed the information given by the employer mm -hmm. and maybe request the employer for additional time uh, though the employer may not if, even if the employer does not approve it but at least somewhere we have conveyed to the employer that it was not reasonable for the employer to expect us to complete the review in so many days i think that is the only safety option that we have informing the employer and requesting for an extension and if it's really not uh, practical and i don't find any reason why an engineer would uh, reject that requirement i think that should be possible right and, and david feel free to sort of jump in and give your thoughts in case you have any on this particular point regarding employer's requirement um and and the meantime let me also lay down another sort of scenario you know i always think that the employer um gets a whole lot of time to actually develop his requirements i mean he's spending or sometimes years together Correct. developing that document um and he has some really heavyweight consultancies or helping him prepare that and despite that you know suppose that the employer's requirement has certain values that were provided by the employer um which let's say have been detailed to the decimal all right and say if uh, the employer's requirement are, are proven to be wrong like in your scenario where when actually the work was being done let's say there's a geotechnical analysis that was done uh, right before the contractor starts with his test piling um and he suddenly finds that the values that the employer's requirement provides which are so detailed to the decimal are, are all are all bad and none of them are reliable um this is a very common place now for the employer to again say that 
you know, it, this is something you should have looked into before. And then you, you had all the time and you had all the, you know, practical, let's say, availability to do those things and perhaps, you know, point out the errors and you didn't have to rely on them. But aren't, aren't these employees' requirements binding on me in any case? You know, in these sort of scenarios, how do you exactly navigate through, you know, if you were advising the, the contractor in such situations? Pretty tough one, I thought, uh, in terms. Uh, for me or for David? Yeah. Uh, David or Murli, whoever. Yeah, David, please go ahead. I'll... Um, yes, I mean it's a common area of dispute. I, I, I think as um, a contractor, you've, you've in in forming the contract, you, you've got to take immense care, and I, I think many contractors are actually don't spend enough time um, on the. Um, substantive obligations in the contract in, in relation to this. I mean, the you know, you know, the technical people come in um, and come up with great ideas that go in the contractor's proposals or whatever the relevant document is in the bid, and they win the bid because they've got the maybe the best technical response and maybe the best economic response to the employer's requirements, and 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 they're in, and that's what they put all their effort into, and they win the contract, and miss really looking at the clauses which define what the um, what the risk allocation is on the employer's requirements not being right and on precisely what the obligation is of the of the the contractor in relation to his own bid you know has he taken the risk by by what he said in his his tender documents so i think it's i think it's a, a matter actually of of putting putting the resource you know if you're if you're up for bidding for a big contract, um, then it is really worth the resource in 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 going through the risk allegation clauses in great detail because yeah, you're stuck with, them. you know, yeah. you're stuck with them. Mm -hmm. Murli, any yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so again, uh, under such circumstances, the example that you're so told mm -hmm. with respect to the geotechnical investigations going completely wrong and com we find completely different soil conditions, and that's I think a very common issue that we face at least in in my organization on a, on a very frequent basis. Uh, so uh, in one of our recent cases that we are still uh, taking up with the employer, uh, the same thing happened. Uh, so the, the entire information that was given to us uh, was wrong and we had to completely change the foundation design. And when we went to the employer, uh, when, we, when we approached the employer asking for a compensation on this, they simply pointed us the disclaimer clause in the geotechnical information that was given to us. But at last, we could somehow make some breakthrough in that particular case where, because the disclaimer clause uh, says that uh, uh, the, the employer shall, sorry, the contractor shall rely upon their own surveys uh, and shall keep them informed of the conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, here, was it possible for the employer to rely on their own survey? That is, that is something that came up for during our discussions. And we showed that we, uh, given the circumstances that prevailed in that particular uh, time, it was not possible for the employer to rely upon their own service. And that's how mm -hmm. we could uh, establish that. I, I think what I'm trying to say is like, we need to look into the exact wording of the disclaimer clause and 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 see if we can yeah. get some respite there. I, I was just thinking while you were saying that, what sort of what sort of an obligation does the employer have when he provides a certain data um, for which he had, you know, years together sort of you know come up with um heavyweight consultants to help them figure those right. things out and yet he gives you the wrong data i mean doesn't that seem a little odd i mean <laughs> i mean should not there be some responsibility on the employer to like at least do a not so negligible job in terms of providing data you know can it be so wrong well um there there are um background laws um Common law, general law rights based on misrepresentation. Mm. So, uh, I mean, if the contractor is induced uh, to enter the contract by the uh, employer saying something that is factually wrong, uh, and the contractor has relied on it, then there would be a common law remedy and damages for that for that misrepresentation. Quite a, quite aside from the contract, you, you'd have to look carefully at, at what the risk allocation of the contract clauses said and whether they whether they had any effect on legal rights based on misrepresentation so 
right. difficult in, 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 and every case might be different. But I mean, that's the only, that's the only real constraint. I mean, uh, um, uh, if, if, you, if you want somebody to do a project, you're entitled to go in the marketplace and say, well, hey, I've got this one line diagram and I, I want you to, you know, this is what I want you to do. Or you're entitled to go out with a thousand pages of detailed um, prescriptive documentation and say, this is what I want you to do. So that, that's, I mean, that is the way it works. That's what employers can do. But mis- misrepresentation is is the legal constraint. Beyond that, it's it's the contract. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you, you just got to take great care in, 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 in going in for a con- going for this contract. Um, right. So let's move to the termination issues also, and we'll stick with David now. Um, David, there was a question which came... Uh, does the does the engineer have the right to issue a notice to correct for the contractor's slow progress? And that's something that uh, does come up quite a bit. Um, well, um, the, the, there's, there's actually a, a right to to issue a notice to correct if there's a failure to comply with any obligation under the contract. Um, mm-hmm. It's quite an extravagant clause, really. So, so the simple answer to that question is is yes, um, but, because there's, no, there's an obligation under the contractor to to proceed, you, you know, um, uh, to, to whatever the wording with due due diligence and, and, and expedition or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, every, every every construction contract has some such wording, and and this one does. So, if right. he's not, then yes, you can serve a notice to to correct. Right. Um, he may say, well, that's invalid because I'm I'm. I'm um, proceeding as quickly as I possibly can. And the only reason it's not as fast as you'd like is because you've not given me access or information or something. So, it'll be, you know, it can be disputed. It might not be right, but but formally, yes, there's a right. Right. And now, since you mentioned any obligation in 99, the 1999 edition does say any obligation and doesn't really restrict it, the material breach. Um, I know that the English law at least perhaps has uh, interpreted that to mean material breach or something which is substantive. But um, well, well, it, it's mm. it's that there is actually a right to to um, serve the notice to correct for um, failure to comply with any obligation, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's material or not. So, I mean, it, it's a bit of a waste of time if if it's something trivial. But actually, it, it bites on every single obligation of the contractor under the under the contract, the right to serve this. Well, the the materiality comes in in relation to whether whether it gives a right to terminate. So you you can you can you can serve you know thousand notices, but if you want to rely on a failure to correct, um, then that failure has to amount to a material breach of of the contract. So um, that's that's where it comes in. So it doesn't stop you um, serving the notice. Understood. This question of whether you can rely on it then for for termination, which is obviously a much more nuanced question, mm-hmm. um, and it, and and that I think becomes really quite contextual. And why earlier on I said, I think one of the advantages for an employer of this clause, despite that restriction of materiality, um, it does give this ability to build up um, a narrative against the contractor over a period of time by a succession of notices. And even if some of your notices are about, are about things that individually would not be um, material in terms of breach, if if you've got dozens of them and, you know, some are more serious, some are less, overall, does this look like uh, a material breach? You know, you're starting to, to to get there, I think, or at least you're giving yourself a better chance as an, as an employer. Um, than just getting in, in in the delay situation. If you're just getting into, you know, he hasn't been um, um, carrying out the works with 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 due progress. You, you're into a big argument then, always, always. And who knows? Somebody's going to be right and somebody's going to be wrong, and you right. won't know the answer until the end of the arbitration, probably. Mm-hmm. But but if you can if you can lay this ground over a period of months, perhaps, um, then I think you you know you've got a you've got a better foundation for your termination. Right. Sometimes going beyond the reasonable period that you've provided, still waiting on seeing whether the contractor has complied with uh, making good and yeah. remedying that situation. And yeah. also show the, the gravity of how much the contractor is not willing to comply with, you know, following his obligations. Yeah, the more patient and 
reasonable you are, then then the better you'll be. But of course, you don't want to miss a chance. <laughs> you don't trickle. want to wait for too long till it becomes yeah. cold. Like my tea over here, which has been waiting here for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Murli, you wanted to add something? Yeah, uh, uh, regarding the specific question that was asked, uh, I think 8.6 of uh, FIDIC uh, gives an explicit right projects. to the engineer to give a notice in case of uh, the progress is uh, much slower and might not lead to the term uh, within the time for completion. Right. So, and I answer, think 8.1 right. does provide what David uh, was saying right, right, with right, due right. expedition and without delay. Right. So that expedition. obligation yeah. arises yeah. from 8.1. <laughs> Uh, I have one question, which is sort of midway between David and Burley's topic. And then I want to jump to Geraldine with a couple more questions. Um, you see, what happens when you are terminating it midway, especially in a yellow book, right? The issue is, well, you know, a lot of designs have already been firmed up, which has been prepared by the contractor. And let's say I terminate, and this is a practical situation, because you terminate that contractor, let's say for his defaults and not being able to complete it, but now you're looking for a replacement contract. As an employer, I want to go ahead with the same designs that I verified and I accepted, and they were good for me. But when the replacement contractor comes in, you know, it's a whole lot of mess for him to also be able to agree to designs um, that were prepared by a yellow book contractor previously. Um, I'm sure you can always tender it out with certain conditions saying you know, these things, but what sort of a risk are we talking about from the employer's point of view and from the contractor's point of view, you know, in these sort of situations where the contractor has developed the design but got terminated and the replacement contractor now needs to come and adopt those designs to perform the, the balance of the works? Well, both parties are going to want to in the negotiations to try and get the other one to take the risk, aren't they? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's a, uh, it's a, uh, Free for all negotiation. Right. Anything, Murli, from your experience? I'm sure. Uh, uh, luckily, not, not experienced in at least in this aspect. <laughs> Lucky enough. All right. Uh, uh, Geraldine, you know, I've seen some modifications with 14.8 uh, where, you know, the employer completely just gets rid of that concerning financing charges. Um, and somehow he's too happy about it. He's, he thinks that, you know what, they're, they're, they're not going to be any financing charges, even if I'm now delayed in performing, you know, in terms of making the payments on time. Um, what are your thoughts on such practice? I mean, some employees do do this on a regular basis. I mean, they sure they do have a timeline, but they get rid of the interest clause. From the employer's point of view, I know you're, you're a contractor's woman. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, I'll, I'll use one of the phrases that David used a few minutes ago, uh, which is background law. So mm -hmm. what you would have to look at is the, the law of the, uh, that actually applies to the particular contract. So if I was to take the law in England, a contractor might, a, a con client might think that they're very clever in doing that. But there's actually a piece of legislation in England, the Late Payment of Commercial Debts Interest Act that says if one party pays the other party late, then you have to pay 8% above the Bank of England base rate as simple interest. So actually the FIDIC clause is a lower rate of interest than is actually uh, in the background law, so to speak. Um, so it, it's definitely not a one size fits all answer that's the first thing to say the second thing to say and you are right my contractor background sometimes does show itself a bit too clearly i think a contractor should be very suspicious of a client that does that mm -hmm. there is a story to be told there and if i was the contractor or advising the contractor i would actually question firstly do they want to enter into a contract with a client who would do this and secondly should they significantly increase their contingency figure for the project or their risk margin? So effectively, is the client going to pay more money by trying to be a bit cute? Um, th there are still other clauses that can kick in in relation to suspension of non-payment and termination, which are a lot worse than paying a bit of interest. I mean, if you think about FIDIC in its original format, 
the 56 day payment period, the requirement for performance <laughs> security, the requirement for retention. And then the pesky client takes the financing charges out. Mm -hmm. I mean, effectively, it's the bank of the contractor who's running the job then. Right. Um, so no, I yeah, my my violin is out for the contractor on your scenario there, Grace. <laughs> definitely. So it's an entire symphony for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not just a four-piece orchestra or whatever. No. Um, and since you did mention about uh, this issue, you know, since the 1999 edition did not have emails back in the day. Mm. Yeah. Um, it was simply a matter of physical copies being submitted to like and you know six copies each. Um, let's say uh, in a scenario where the contractor is actually doing this via email, do you think that the clause requirement is effectively met still or without the amendment? Okay, or so I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll start with my paranoid answer to this, which is the word email doesn't appear in 1.3. Mm -hmm. So on a strict reading of the contract, then actually a payment, um, a monthly statement issued by email would not be valid. That's the starting point. What you can quickly get into, though, is an argument about, um, uh, what would I say, conduct of the parties. And has the conduct of the parties actually changed the contract? Now, I've got an issue with that as well because it's the contractor sending it to the engineer and the engineer reacting and the engineer isn't a party to the contract either so the engineer cannot change the terms and conditions so again i'm back to don't sign a contract that doesn't have email in it i before this <laughs> lecture today i was laughing with a client who had a parent company guarantee and they wanted me to have a look at it and they use the word fax five times in the parent company guarantee. <laughs> and I said to the contractor, have you got a fax in your office? And he said, no. <laughs> so I said, right, we need to go through and get rid of the word fax. So it's, it's amazing, really, how quickly this can become out of date. Last week, I was working on another job. And it was a colleague of mine who actually wrote a letter on behalf of one of the parties would you believe that a big chunk of the letter involved screen dumps from WhatsApp in relation to instructions under the contract? And I just think, you know, you sign a contract that somebody has lovingly drafted and then you think, well, I can't be bothered with that. I'll just do something different. And it's wrong. You shouldn't sign contracts that you are not willing to comply with. So for me, Rule but the market one. is such, you know, I mean, you're going to go hungry otherwise. I, mean, you... <laughs> I think at tender stage, if a client and an um, employer contractor are talking and negotiating about terms and conditions, if they won't accept a contract amendment that says emails are allowed, again, there's something funny going on there. A bit like delete 4.8. I'm kind of getting the measure of what you're like, you know, on the other side of the table. So I don't want people to go off piste and not follow the contract. Again, I'll use that phrase I used earlier, deed of variation. Uh, many years ago, I was working for a Dutch subcontractor who was working for a Japanese contractor who was working for an American client, and the job was in Russia. Did they send any letters by post? No. Everything was done by email, but what did the contract say? By post. They did decide to um, execute a deed of variation on that project because otherwise emails from both sides, there was a risk there. So sort the contract out at tender stage, rule one, or a deed of variation, or I'll say again, join Gamblers Anonymous. <laughs> there, there is a good chance that it might work, but it's not guaranteed so certainly I'm watching my own PI here that's not something I'm going to advise a contractor or client to do you should maybe start one of this and be the, be the founders of the campus <laughs> yeah. Partic the, the, con the contractors and clients uh, section of Gamblers <laughs> Anonymous I think yeah absolutely I'd, I'd get a great membership I'm sure so 
All right. Well, uh, we've had a long day, and uh, it's uh, it was wonderful to hear all of you. Um, and with that, I think I just want to thank uh, all the three of you for your uh, valuable time and you know providing us with such valuable you know insightful information and experience. Um, and I'm sure all the people who are watching and those who are going to watch later, you know, in their leisure time, will certainly have uh, great value to take out of it. So thanks a lot. I think this is the. I think I'm, maybe I'll see Geraldine again. I don't know. Uh, depends, depends on Paul Patrick's availability, gracious. So. But uh, thanks, David, and thanks, Murli, for your time. Thank you. Appreciate Pleasure. it. Pleasure. Well, Thank you, you very much. Summer. Good okay. afternoon, still, or good evening over there, or, yeah. and good night to you, Murli. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.